The fact that I'm even alive at all actually is testament to the amazing support and guidance that I've had from Mercy Care uh, and the real patience, uh, love and understanding that I've had from my partner um, and family. I always like to look at my story by, uh, by saying first of all that I'm a big fan of music. Um, I love uh, Pink Floyd and I'm a particular fan of uh, Dark Side of the Moon. One of the lines goes, hanging on in quiet desperation is the English way. Uh, you know, we like uh, talking about the weather, we drink a lot of tea, uh, we always think we're going to win the World Cup. Um, and we're not very good at, at talking about feelings or how we feel. And we tend to make, I suppose we make light of, of an emotional situation rather than be open and honest about it. Um, which is all well and good, but I think if, if something or someone in life is bothering you, instead of, of addressing it or addressing them, you tend to bury it and it can fester. By the time I was kind of in my uh, early 20s, I was in a real bad place. I was, I was very depressed. Um, as a teenager, I'd, I'd been through uh, difficult spells anyway. Um, you know, I, I couldn't look at anybody really without going bright red. I, I hated eye contact. Um, I went through periods of low mood. Um, I even had what would be described as kind of psychotic thoughts and, and beliefs. Um, I sort of felt like everybody could read my mind. Um, so this all built up and by the time I was in my early 20s, I was standing by uh, on the bank of the River Thames and I wanted to basically throw myself off, kill myself, um, but it didn't. And then I thought, well, who can I talk to? Um, so I went to my GP and um, you know, we had a bit of a conversation about my low mood and he, he kind of tried to reassure me by saying that people my age don't get depressed. So I, I kind of like agreed and said, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, but actually afterwards I thought, I, well, I felt uh, fobbed off. I felt a bit pissed off by, by what he'd said. But I, I sort of just got on with life as before, albeit uh, hanging on in quiet desperation. Um, so at some point then, um, I think to get on in life, I, I kind of de developed a mask that could hide this moody, anxious, not so nice person within and project a kind of happier, more confident version of myself. Uh, a Mr. Nice Guy, if you like. Uh, and for quite a long time, this mask served me very well um, up until around about the um, spring of 2015, um, the mask was just slipping off. Uh, to be honest, I was, I was exhausted. I was working 16 hour days. Uh, I was juggling an acting career with a, uh, a bar job that I was managing a bar. Um, I was having migraines. Uh, my mood was, was very, very low. Uh, I didn't realize how low my mood was, however, until I did a job for the university. And as an actor, I used to um, do role play sessions with medical students. Um, and I, I played a patient this one day who had depression. And as I was saying the lines of this person who had depression, um, I found actually that I was relating to, to it. Um, and at some point in the day, I started crying, which was very unusual for me, and I couldn't stop. I had no control over it. And um, that went on all afternoon. And by the end of the day, the examiner who had been working with, she kind of went, wow, you're a good actor. <laughs> and I said, no, no. I said, that's not me acting. That, that's actually how I feel. Um, and she said, well, maybe you should probably go and see someone yourself. Um, so I did. And after a couple of weeks, I went to see my doctor. And um, he asked me some, some very good, relevant questions, actually, and um, kind of got to the root of, well, not to the root of what was bothering me, but he, he established that I was depressed. And uh, he prescribed me with some medication, referred me for some talking therapy, uh, although the talking therapy wouldn't start for a while. Um, so I said yes to both. I went away and after a few days of taking the medication, I felt a lot worse, markedly worse. So um, I contacted the GP and explained and, and they upped the dose. And then a few days later, I felt worse again. And this happened actually about four or five times. And within a month of having first gone to my GP, um, I was now actually suicidal. I was self-harming pretty much daily. Um, 
and yeah I just wasn't in a good way so by the time I actually got to the uh, therapist the talking therapist um, she referred me straight to the crisis team and then within 10 days I think it was uh, I was in Broad Oak I, I, I was admitted to, to hospital which was a bit strange because um, you know I had a lot of preconceptions about hospital psychiatric units I think my girlfriend and I had watched too many movies um, and it, it probably wasn't helped by the fact that you know two guys in uniform came to the flat to pick me up uh, but actually when I went it, it wasn't that bad you know it was a, a fairly relaxed ward um, I felt uh, that I was I was getting you know the, the care that was right for me at that time the rest that I probably needed you know stopping work and you know having that bit of respite um, and I was also diagnosed with a, uh, a thyroid disorder which I never knew I had and which initially they thought was the the cause of my uh, depression if you like um, but I wasn't being very open about my other kind of psychotic experiences uh, and they were going to discharge me after a couple of weeks so I thought maybe I should you know let it all out and tell them what was going on they decided to put me on some antipsychotics which really did calm me down and after a couple of months of being in Broad Oak I was, I was discharged uh, I was then referred to the early intervention service in, in psychosis I started some uh, CBT at about uh, 20 sessions with a therapist who, who kind of you know helped me to, to rationalize uh, intrusive thoughts which was a, a bit of a problem at that time um, and I kind of got to a point where I, I could see thoughts as just thoughts you know and, and let them sort of come and go um, I was uh, starting to access the life rooms um, started doing some uh, some courses with the recovery college and things were going sort of okay for a while but uh, I did start facing a lot of pressure from a partner at home to uh, get back to work get back to normality but I didn't I didn't really feel ready um, a psychiatrist uh, didn't feel I was ready uh, and this did put pressure on at home and it wasn't helped by the fact that my partner was having um, a very difficult time herself. Um, within the space of about three weeks, she lost her auntie to cancer, who we visited on her deathbed. Um, her mum had a stroke and her uncle was uh, murdered in his own flat. And um, we'd, we'd been out of contact with the uncle for a long time and we, we came to the you know see the flat a week after the murder and it was like a it was like a nightmare because there was writing sprawled all over the walls the place was a pigsty um, and it was disturbing just because he was murdered where we were actually stood and I think all of this had a, an effect on me and it, it, I found that my mental health did then deteriorate um, and, I, and I kind of relapsed if you like back into a, a, an even worse state than I was in before and I was being seen for about uh, three or four weeks every day by my care coordinator uh, to try and keep me out of hospital I found that I was uh, trawling the internet looking for, for ways to kill myself um, my self-harming got a lot worse um, I was having kind of very strange experiences where I'd, I'd see the face of someone I knew kind of on on the face of someone else if you know what I mean so like just to give you a bit of context I, I'd, I'd look at the lollipop lady in the street and um, my dad's face would be on the body of the lollipop lady um, I felt like very paranoid I, I, I was convinced everybody could read my, my thoughts read my mind and um, yeah I, I just I, I wanted out basically and uh, I ended up going back to Broad Oak um, and that was actually really really a positive experience um, they did try me on um, a medication that caused me to have uh, a kind of heart failure actually I was I was treated by the heart failure clinic and they, they said it was probably a, a result of the uh, clozapine I was on one-to-one -one care for about two weeks um, so I couldn't even go to the loo without somebody watching me and I said to the uh, to the nurse who was with me that particular afternoon I said this is annoying I said you know I, I can't deal with this and he said well it's up to you to change it and actually he was right he was he was perfectly right that you know I had to make the decision to get better but actually something clicked in my in my head I think the shock of having the heart failure and I think the shock of my partner saying in so many words I've had enough of this you know I can't I can't cope because I can't I don't recognize the person that I'm with anymore you know I, I don't know who you are I think that kind of gave me a sort of a shock therapy 
in, it, in its own way. And um, I, I wanted to get better, and I started engaging more with the, with the hospital staff. Um, I, I got involved with the activities that were there. I learned how to, to cook a few different things. You know, I learned how to make a lemon drizzle cake, actually, which I still make to this day. Um, I was doing some of the art therapy and I, and I came out, I, I was diagnosed with something called schizoaffective disorder, uh, which is a, a kind of a combination really of psychosis and depression. And um, I was referred for some cognitive analytic therapy, which I had for about a year. Um, and I saw a wonderful therapist uh, who really helped me and really helped me get to grips with, um, you know, the, why I was self-harming in particular. Uh, I began to see self-harm as a habit um, that I was doing uh, because uh, it, w it was basically to stop me from dealing with the feelings that I was struggling to, to cope with, if you like. It was easier to, to, to hurt myself physically and push those feelings down. Um, but that's what the therapy really helped me with. Um, it helped me to, I suppose, uh, know myself a lot better, to represent myself a lot better. The participation uh, manager here got me involved in all sorts of volunteering opportunities. I was attending uh, quality assurance committee meetings as a service user representative. Um, and I was, I was feeling, you know, a lot better within myself and I, I then thought, um, because I've been approached about a, a job opportunity at the Life Rooms, um, I thought, why well, not go for it? And, and I got it. Um, and, um, and that's really led, led to me being where I am today. What the Life Rooms has done and what um, therapy has done has given me those tools to be able to deal with, with those problems that would, in, in, in times past, have you know, caused me to maybe be unwell for quite a long time without sounding corny about it, I, I wouldn't be alive if it wasn't for Mercy Care. Uh, and I think one of the, the biggest positives about Mercy Care is the fact that it uses its service users to make that difference as well. You know, we're all involved, whether it's in designing recovery college courses or in the way in which care is actually delivered, whether it's you know, recruitment panels, and, and you've got a service user on the recruitment panel. Service users are, are, are very much at the heart of that, and, um, and and I have been myself, and and continue to be. So yeah, I'm I'm in a, a lot better place now, and um, I'm pleased to say I'm no longer hanging on in quiet desperation.